Family mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our English Australia webinar today. If you can hear me and see my screen, could you please type in in your dialog box? So if you can hear me and see my screen, could you please type in your responses? Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. So today's session is called Changing Our Default Settings. And the session is really about examining our attitudes to educational technology. To present our session, we have with us Kyle Smith from Brisbane. Hello, Kyle. Hello. Kyle has worked in international education for over 13 years um, as a teacher, manager, and curriculum developer. He's currently teaching English for academic purposes at International Education Services. Um, now, since 2011, Kyle has been involved in various English Australia activities. Um, mainly, he's been writing reviews for the English Australia Journal, um, doing reviews of books in education technology, educational technology in ELT. Today's session was a session Kyle presented at the English Australia Conference in September last year. So we're very excited because this session had a fantastic response. Um, so Kyle, welcome and thank you for being here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Apana. Thanks, English Australia, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, this is a, it's kind of a, uh, not a repeat of the uh, conference um, presentation, but a, sort of a spin-off or a slight reorientation. Um, uh, on my um, on my blog, if you're interested in in kind of um, finding out more about specifically about the conference presentation um, and some other ideas um, relating to um, the, the webinar today, uh, yeah, you can go to my blog uh, there, uh, pedagogablog.wordpress.com, um, and um, follow up some of those um, posts. And um, uh, there's also you know a lot of links to other resources and articles and and research which. Um, um, uh, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend even if you sort of want to skip past my my actual writing. Um, and perhaps if you uh, if you have any questions or comments during the uh, during the webinar, you can um, feel free to share them as we go along, and, and perhaps a partner can pass them along along to me straight away, or, or save them until the end, or, or you can also save your questions to the end as well. So um, we're going to start with a, a little bit of trivia. And can you um, identify this person here? And if so, you can uh, type into the, the chat box if you've got any ideas who he is. It's not Yul Brynner, in case, uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, a couple of hints. It's a, uh, he is a, a French philosopher. He died in 1984. First name, Michel. We've got a few suggestions. It's not Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, although it does look a bit like um, uh, Michael Fassbender, Fassbender, Fassbender in the, uh, the new Steve Jobs movie, so that's a fair, a fair call, I think. Perhaps time to reveal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Michel Foucault. Uh, well known, perhaps, or best known, perhaps, for his discussion of uh, the sort of the notion of the panopticon, uh, constant surveillance. Um, but uh, I want to focus on this quote from him uh, for a moment. Um, can you guess what the missing words are? And again, you can uh, type if you like into the chat box, and, and a partner can share with. Uh, can share some of those with me. I, I can't see the actual um, comments, um, unfortunately. 
Um, we've got a few suggestions. Bad, dangerous, bad default, biased, <laughs> relatable, bad and dangerous, bad, dreadful. All right, so you're on the right track. The first one is bad, and the second one is dangerous. So some of you might have perhaps heard that quote. Uh, I heard it first last year um, in an um, online presentation I watched of um, in, there's a plane going overhead. I, you can probably hear that. But I heard this quote last year um, in a presentation I watched online by Neil Selwyn. Um, and um, it's sort of stayed in my mind ever since. Um, it constantly kind of comes to mind as I think and write and talk about um, technology. But I'd like to ask you now, what, um, how do you think it relates to technology in education, and perhaps um, technology in your own context? And um, before I move on, I can, uh, again, uh, maybe take a, a moment to, to think and or uh, type some responses in the chat box. I'm thinking, for example, about um, what our default settings are in terms of technology, uh, about our practices, what we do with them in our classrooms and schools, or what we say about them, and also um, in terms of changing our default settings, what sort of practices um, might, we, might we want to change to. Um, and just while you're thinking and, and typing, perhaps, um, just in my own case, and I'm, I'm focusing in this webinar on internet-connected technologies in particular, uh, they can be good. There's no question about that. So as Foucault says, not, not everything is bad. Um, and I've been guilty um, you know, in the last couple of years of perhaps um, maybe overemphasizing the, the bad and ignoring the fact that, that there are benefits. Um, in my case, I use Twitter frequently. For example, I, I use it on an, on an iPhone, an iPad, and, a, and an iMac, and, and I've gotten a lot out of it. I uh, wouldn't be here talking to you now without, um, without the technologies involved and the internet. But there are dangers. So Kyle, we do have a few responses. Would you like me to um, read them out to you? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Um, technology in education is bad, and if it's misused, can become dangerous. Um, Another response, we need to be aware of the dangers of technology. Um, another response is, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking or doing it makes it so. Um, people reject ideas based on the fear of the unfamiliar. Um, and that can be extended to how teachers feel about technology. Um, Someone else has clarified by bad, they mean misuse of technology can make it dangerous. Technology can be addictive. Overuse can also make it dangerous. So those are some of our responses. Okay, thanks Thanks for those. Um, yeah, I think some important points there. Um, and in terms of the, the dangers, um, I'm going to be just, I guess, just barely scraping the surface. Um, you know, different technologies have, have a range of kind of different dangers if, if we're going to use uh, Foucault's term there. Um, and we can really only, only scratch the surface um, in about 40 so minutes this afternoon. Uh, and I'm going to try to weave together um, an argument about um, informed consent, uh, the, the informed consent of our students particularly, but also our staff, and um, privacy and um, internet connected technologies. So hopefully that sort of that hangs together. Um, so thinking about Twitter again, one of the dangers is that um, uh, in my own use is that I, I might tweet something, for example, um, that um, maybe is offensive to somebody or might be slanderous maybe, uh, and it could get me fired, it could destroy you know, whatever reputation I have. Um, so that's a, perhaps an obvious danger there for me. Uh, but uh, I think I'm aware of at least some of the dangers. There, there may be some dangers of, of using Twitter, maybe some um, downsides to it um, that I'm not aware of, but I think I'm aware of at least some of them. Uh, and I make a decision for myself to use the service, um, making a kind of um, cost-benefit ana analysis or you know, danger-benefit um, analysis. Um, so. I think it, you know it's 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 informed consent 
um, uh, to the extent that um, you know um, that that's possible in using um, something like some you know um, technology like Twitter that's connected to the internet. As soon as you connect it to the internet, what happens to you know the things that I tweet, for example, my data, my content? Um, it, it becomes very hard to to know exactly what's happening to that, but um, to an extent, at least, it's an example of informed consent. However, in Elicos, as well as education more generally, things are more complicated um, because we have students involved, um, and getting their informed consent um, is, uh, is is quite complex. I think. Um, so I want you to think about the National Code of Practice for a moment, and consider this question. To what extent do you think the National Code emphasises the need for educational providers to obtain informed consent from overseas students about the educational services they're signing up for? So um, in the National Code, do you think there is an emphasis on providers obtaining informed consent from students before signing them up for a course. Again, if you can um, type some response into the chat box, you can say yes, um, if there's a strong emphasis, or no, there is no emphasis, or it's completely absent, or, or something like that would be useful. The, the question again, because it's kind of a bit long-winded, I suppose. Um, to what extent do you think the National Code emphasises the need for educational providers to obtain informed consent from our students um, before we sign them up for educational services? I don't know. That's quite a broad question as well. There's a lot of things to to get their consent and inform them of. So, Kyle, some of the responses state that colleges do let their students know that technology will be involved in their courses um, and often also suggest that they bring their own devices if that's a requirement of the course. Yep. Uh, some people are trying to Google it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth reading. I had a kind of a read through the standards in the National Code earlier this week to, to get a sense. Um, it doesn't talk specifically about informed consent in relation to technology, um, but I think the idea of informed consent, uh, to me, is a strong part of the national code. Um, standard two, for example, states that um, educational providers must provide students with, quote, current and accurate information regarding, unquote, among other things, details of any arrangements with another registered provider person or business to provide the course or part of the course. Um, and I, I think, you know, you could maybe um, infer from that, again, the sort of the idea of informed consent that um, if a student is going to make a, an informed decision about um, the, the benefits of a um, particular course over another one and weigh that up against kind of any um, risks perhaps of, of um, um, not getting the service they want or something like that, um, then they would need current and accurate information regarding any other providers, persons or business that, that might be involved in the provision. So that if the, the provider that they signed up with actually then says, oh, surprise, you know, you've got to go and, and do your course with this other um, uh, person, you know, they, they would need to know about that. Um, so bringing this to the idea of uh, privacy, I think students would also want to receive current and accurate information regarding practices which result in personal information or data being collected about them. Um, in other words, they, they'd want a meaningful privacy policy, I think, um, in terms of the provider providing current and accurate information that would extend, I think, to uh, privacy policy. And um, indeed, the ESOS Act uh, refers to the Australian privacy principles which you can, uh, you can access um, on the website of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Um, so the privacy principles referred to in the ESOS Act are available here. 
And just to pause for a moment, um, just I'd like you to think about a couple of questions and, and perhaps respond if you can in the chat box. Are you in a position of responsibility in terms of privacy policies at your, um, at your educational institution? So do you have to write the policy? Do you have to um, kind of uh, check for compliance? Um, or are you expected to comply with it as a member of staff, um, or all three? Uh, and if so, are you aware of the Australian privacy principles? And have you read them? I wasn't aware of them until earlier this week preparing for this webinar and um, I, I saw the reference to them in the ESOS Act and um, went and followed them, them up and, and read them. So are you aware of them? Have, have you read them? And I, I'm by no means a, an expert on privacy. It's something that I'm sort of trying to um, kind of teach myself about. Um, so, um, but if you know, if you want to know more, you can always contact the Office of the Information Commissioner yourself. Um, so, Kyle, some of the uh, responses are mainly saying no. Um, they're not in 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 a position where they read or design the privacy policies. Um, yeah. But students are expected to comply with the school's policy? Yep. Okay, well, um, kind of moving along um, to the, the Privacy Act 1988, that's a, a Commonwealth law. I think there's also state laws that, that apply as well, but Privacy Act 1988 states that an APP ent entity, so that's an Australian um, privacy principle en entity, and an enti entity including an organisation or small business operator, so I, I think that would include our uh, schools. Um, an APP entity must not do an act, it must not engage in a practice that breaches an Australian privacy principle. Uh, and just my point there with that is, is to emphasise the, the significance, um, at least by my limited grasp of this, the, the uh, significance of the privacy principles as a feature of the, the privacy law. And uh, we'll look at Australian privacy principle number one, which requires open and transparent management of personal information. Um, and the object of it is to ensure that APP entities, like uh, perhaps our schools, small business operators, organisations, manage personal information in an open and transparent way. And um, I would ask, how compliant is your school with this principle? Just as a rhetorical question, um, uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that you respond to that in the, in the chat box. Um, but just um, think for a moment, how compliant do you think it is? Think of the, the work day to day that uh, administrative staff do, marketing staff, management, teachers. Uh, and I've, I've read um, a couple of um, privacy policies of a, of a few schools um, in the last couple of days. And it seems to me that, um, uh, that those policies are, are very comprehensive and I would assume um, that that they that they comply with uh, the law. I mean, yeah. Again, I'm no expert. I wouldn't be in a position to to, to decide otherwise. But I do think that um, despite this and despite the best of intentions, we in Ellicos and other sectors may breach this um, privacy principle in spirit, uh, although maybe not in word. I think we may breach it regularly. And there's a, a strong argument also that the, the privacy principles are, are perhaps inadequate given certain technologies and technological developments. Um, and, that, and, and also because of the way that technology leaps way ahead of policies, of standards, it leaps way ahead of expectations and our understandings of the technologies themselves. Uh, and it also can leap way ahead of legislation to such an extent that it may make um, those policies and expectations and understandings kind of irrelevant. Um, and in the case of student privacy, for example, um, I think this is one important way that technology is dangerous. So part of the problem, as I see it, um, 
is that the ESOS Act focuses on protecting students in a situation involving up to three parties. Um, the student is one of the parties, the education provider, the second party, and an educational agent as a third party. Um, it's bad enough already, I think, that the nature of the relationship between two of those parties, the provider and the agent, is not uh, often transparent to the student, for example, in terms of agent commissions. Um, sorry, just um, working in two different um, two different uh, applications. Um, so, for all the good intentions of the ESOS Act, students are already not in possession of all the, the relevant information when making a decision about which college, college to study with. Uh, I would argue, at least in some cases. However, what are the implications if there are actually more than three parties? That there are additional parties, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth party, for example, Turnitin. Uh, I, I would consider uh, that Turnitin may be an additional party to that relationship in that the student pays the provider, the provider pays Turnitin to, um, and then the student is required to submit intellectual property to Turnitin. But we'll, we'll come talk about that a little bit more. But is there an additional party in that relationship and is the nature of that relationship made transparent? Uh, to the student. Um, what happens if the involvement of these additional parties, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth party, and the collection of student data by them is not disclosed to students? What happens if the providers, despite the utmost, in, utmost sincerity in meeting their legal and ethical obligations, aren't even aware of the involvement of an additional parties, which is the case when it comes to some technologies and the internet? And what happens if in any of these scenarios these additional parties are profiting from the student data that they receive? Uh, then I think, as I said before, the, the kind of the idea of um, uh, that you know, things kind of become a little bit more complex and the, and the, the task of, of providing open and transparent information to students um, becomes um, more challenging. So coming back to informed consent, in this kind of context, I think there are three ways in which informed consent in terms of opting into and opting out of particular technologies becomes kind of problematic or, or maybe even meaningless or irrelevant. Um, so I want to focus on three case studies. The first one being Turnitin. So where some technologies such as Turnitin are concerned, we make the decision for our student. So um, not only is there perhaps not enough information, but there is actual, actually no real consent from the student to, to speak of. Um, the students don't opt in, and they aren't realistically able to opt out. Um, they, are not, they may not be presented with an explicit um, uh, kind of question do you consent to the use of um, to, to submitting your um, say your intellectual property in the in the form of essays to this additional party for-profit organisation? Um, and it seems to me they may not be realistically able to opt out um, if they don't submit uh, their assignment through Turnitin um, or kind of maybe at, at, uh, if you're doing higher uh, high degree research through Authenticate, also owned by Turnitin, then you may not be able to pass the assignment and, and therefore you may not be able to complete the course. Is opting out uh, and therefore is consent kind of um, really a meaningful concept here? And worse, it may not even have occurred to the school's teachers and staff that there may be very good reasons for the student to opt out um, that the, the school may need to discuss with the students uh, before giving them, um, you know, uh, the ability to opt in or, or opt out. So, what possible reasons might somebody to have uh, to opt out of Turnitin? Uh, well, with Turnitin, the student pays the the school. The school pays Turnitin, so student uh, Turnitin profits in that way in the first instance. Then the student um, uploads their essay kind of donates their intellectual property to turn it in. 
and then I would argue turn in, um, profits uh, kind of in the second instance from that intellectual property um, in a couple of ways. One is that um, the more students work uh, is uploaded, uh, the easier it is, I think, for Turnitin to market itself as sort of like you know, the best or the only choice in plagiarism detection or, or, um, or kind of checking software. Uh, and so it becomes more marketable and therefore also possibly more profitable. Um, then there's also the ability for Turnitin to use its algorithms to analyze students' work to gain additional kind of insights into the um, kind of the, the writing process and, and content which you can then use to improve its services, develop additional services um, and sell those on and, uh, and increase its, uh, its, increase its uh, profits. Um, so I think there's, there's a few issues there, plus it also gathers data from the students, um, maybe metadata for example. Um, about the computer that they're using or the device they're using to upload their um, their work. Um, so there's a, I think there's a, a few issues there, and I think it would be quite reasonable for students to want to opt out, um, but um, they may not be given that um, that opportunity. Moving on to a second case study, Facebook um, represents a situation where the decision to use the technology hasn't been made for the student, so there may still be consent, perhaps unlike as unlike with turn it in. Um, but there may, may still be factors, for example, peer pressure that we are not aware of, which subtly coerce the students into using the technology regardless, so that opt opting out again isn't isn't a realistic option. Um, so what's wrong with students using Facebook? Um, to, to kind of work out maybe what the dangers are of using Facebook, uh, you could check their terms of service. Uh, they also have a data policy, other, other companies might call it a privacy policy. Uh, but to find out, say, what, um, what kind of uh, copyright license, for example, Facebook has um, over the photos and things that you upload, um, and also to find out what they will do with your data, you could read their um, terms of service or data policy. Um, just to uh, stop for a moment, how many words do you think would be contained in the in total in the terms of service and the data policy? So if somebody was going to read those to try to um, kind of get that uh, accurate, correct information about what's going to happen with their data and their intellectual property, their photos, etc., how many words would they have to read? Can you um, type in a an estimate in the chat box. Three thousand, twenty thousand. <laughs> That's yeah, sort of between those, between three three thousand and twenty thousand. So, um, terms of service and the data policy combined, it's six thousand two hundred words. Currently, uh, that's um, the latest version. I think like thirty first of January. Um, so do we really expect teachers, let alone our students, our international students, to, to read 6,200 words? And, and if so, do we really expect them to make any sense of it um, to the point that we could say confidently that they are, uh, that they are informed and that they can make a, a genuine kind of um, analysis of the, 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 the dangers, the risks? Um, uh, I, I would say not. Um, I think that... Um, you know, even just skimming it for us, one of us here skimming it, you know, may take a decent amount of time. Um, Jonathan Obar, um, and there's a, a reference at the end um, to this article if you want to follow it up. But Jonathan Obar has argued that um, this is a kind of data privacy self-management, sort of saying that um, that users um, are responsible for managing their own. Um, data privacy by reading terms of services and, and data policies and things like that. And he's called that a fallacy, the data privacy self-management fallacy. And he's called it an unattainable ideal. So this is a case where, uh, in terms of Facebook, uh, we may be providing consent. Uh, students may be consenting, but there may be subtle, subtle coercive um, factors. Um, but also, even, even in this case, um, informed consent is, is perhaps not 
are realistic. Okay, so moving on to uh, to kind of understanding what you know what are the problems with Facebook? Why might somebody oops, why might somebody uh, want to um, not want to participate in, in Facebook? Whether it's like a school Facebook page or a class Facebook page or a Facebook group. Um, to understand the terms of service, there's this uh, tool here, Terms of Service Didn't Read, which can um, kind of help to um, understand what's happening. Uh, and it kind of um, translates the terms of service into plain speak. You can add it as a, a little um, a browser um, add-on, browser extension, um, quite uh, quite useful. So when we look at this, we see a little bit more about some of the dangers of Facebook. So there's the issue of the very broad copyright license. Um, are, our, are our students aware of that? Are we talking to them about that? making sure they're informed before they um, get involved in using Facebook. Um, it tracks you on other websites, so as you can see um, there it says uh, this service uses cookies to track you even if you're not interacting with them directly. Um, so Facebook can track you through cookies um, even if you visit another website. So a cookie um, very simply is um, what happens is that if you go to uh, you might go to a website, maybe it's ABC News, you'll see a little Facebook share icon. What's happening there is that um, the, the HTML code on the ABC website is directing your browser to go to um, a server um, run by perhaps or rented by, at least by Facebook, download that, that little image of the Facebook um, logo, download it onto your computer, your device, and when it does that, it also uploads data about your device, your computer, the IP address, the date, the time, and then it can use that to track you. If you go to another website uh, which has the Facebook share icon, it can sort of say, oh, okay, well, it's the same IP address um, visiting this other website, and it can be begin to gather information about your browsing habits. Uh, moving on, we see also a couple of other issues that Facebook automatically shares your data with many other services. So it, it goes from two parties with a student uh, interacting with Facebook, and then it quickly kind of multiplies to you know there's Bing owned by Microsoft, Pandora, TripAdvisor, and so on and so on and so on. Um, Facebook uses your data for many purposes, so a little bit like Turnitin, um, I would argue that. Um, the, the data that you're uploading, the metadata, sort of behavioral stuff, content, photos, etc., they can use that to improve their services, perhaps um, design additional services, um, improve their profitability, um, design other services to, to that they can sell or, or maybe just to generate more advertising revenue. So Facebook are profiting from the data of students, for example, if, if um, students are uh, using Facebook. And then finally, there's this issue here about uh, the camera and the microphone in the phone being um, activated by Facebook, um, and and that's a problem as well in terms of privacy. Um, it can happen at any time without your consent. So again, um, are are we discussing these with our students before we even mention anything about Facebook in the classroom? Are we even aware of them of them ourselves? Are we at the same time talking to them at all about digital digital literacy? Because I think if we're talking about digital literacy, and we're not even aware of these, let alone talking about them with, with students, then I think the, the idea of digital literacy really becomes kind of very hollow. Um, you know, and it kind of it ends up being about sort of things like you know teaching students how to use how to make memes um, using meme generator and. I mean, I think that's that's very questionable. So, if students want to get onto Facebook of their own volition in their own time, that's that's up to them. Um, again, it's not inherently bad; uh, it's certainly dangerous. But I think um, us educators should steer very clear of anything that could be coercive, including a school Facebook page, class Facebook groups, and to stick our heads in the sand about this, um, despite um, kind of increasingly available. 
um, um, information about the problems with Facebook um, to stick our heads in the sand, sort of maybe because marketing, for example, or because of 21st century learning or whatever it is, uh, I, I think that's negligent. Uh, I want to move on to a third final kind of case study uh, and then move and then kind of start to talk about uh, responses. So um, the third case study involves your school's own website. And I think this is an example of a technology of uh, an example where technologies may in, may be involved without staff or students even realizing it. And so um, again it renders informed consent meaningless. And um, by this I'm talking about uh, the third party trackers on the school's website, which um, also involves cookies, but it also involves other technologies as well. Uh, cookies is the one that's maybe that most people are aware of, but there are other ones like uh, web beacons and browser browser fingerprinting, for example. Um, Timothy Leibert um, compares third party web tracking to the tracking bracelets ornithologists place on migratory birds. Um, and so, as I said before, you go to ABC News, your browser downloads the Facebook uh, um, icon, share icon, and that's used to, it sort of renders you tagged and traceable because it links, um, it, it, it has your IP address and, um, and it can trace you and track you um, as you use other websites. Um, so a little bit like a, a bird being uh, um, leg banded. So one of these uh, third party web trackers is called uh, New Relic. Um, there's this tool called Ghostery um, which can help you find out about it. There's other browser add-ons that, that you could um, use to find out about it. Um, but uh, New Relic is one. And um, this is one of six trackers, for example, that I found on um, the, um, the website of a publicly funded um, institution. But it's used on about 70,000 sites. Uh, another one of these web trackers is Google Analytics, which is one million sites, and almost certainly including um, the website of your own school. Uh, when somebody accesses, say, a website with this tracker on it, New Relic, um, uh, sorry, your browser, the, the user's browser will download cookie which collects, begins to collect data about that, uh, about that user or about our student if they visit um, our school's website. Some of the data that they, um, that might be collected about them um, as per the privacy policy at New, New Relic uh, could be anonymous data, should, uh, pseudonymous data or PII or personally identifiable information. Uh, but there's a growing body of literature which actually argues very strongly that um, these categories are virtually meaningless and that um, uh, seemingly anonymous data can be de-anonymized um, uh, quite easily. So I think we should never assume that a particular set of data, for example data collected about students accessing or just accessing a school website, we shouldn't assume that that, that, that will remain anonymous. Um, they uh, New Relic also shares this data with third parties. So again, we're going from we're going from the school uh, the, the student accessing the school's website. Maybe it's to um, to log into the school's learning management system or to find information about attendance or to check the privacy policy. Maybe um, so it's the student school's website. It's New Relic, and then it is um, some sort of unknown number of third parties. And they don't tell us as well how long they will retain that data for. Uh, another example that I found, this, this is a quote from a, a privacy policy of, a, of an Ellicott College, uh, tells us that um, the site uses Lucky Orange. Um, similar to New Relic, um, provides a slightly different service for the owner of the website. Um, in that it may record mouse clicks, mouse movements, scrolling activity, and keystroke information. So keystroke information, that means if you uh, type into a search field, if you type something into a search field, even if you don't press enter and get any search results, that information can still be captured 
and it goes to Lucky Orange and then on to, well, it's very opaque as to who else might have that and what it might be done, what might be done with it. Uh, again, which means the idea of transparent and open information about um, what happens to students' data um, starts to become uh, a bit fanciful, an unattainable ideal. Uh, this is from Timothy Leibert's article, uh, well worth reading to sort of help to understand some of this com uh, complex stuff. Uh, he analysed the trackers on the top one million websites and he found that um, Google um, was present on 78, gathering data about people, Seven, sorry, 78 percent of the top one million websites. Google was there gathering data. Facebook um, on 32 percent. Uh, the third one there, along from the left, after Facebook is Akamai, and um, probably never heard of Akamai. I hadn't before I read uh, Timothy Leibert's article. But, um, but Akamai, uh, basic, sorry, basically fa um, Facebook use Akamai for web, host, web hosting services and, and other companies do. So the fact, I think, that Facebook uses them is it explains why they're, they're so high there and gathering data about so many people. Um, Twitter there, you've got Amazon a little bit further down. Um, Automatic, if you see that between Addis and Yahoo. Automatic, that's the company that owns WordPress. So if you go to my blog, for example, it's a WordPress blog, Automatic will be gathering data about you. Uh, and then all the way down the end is New Relic there. Uh, and that's, you know, that's um, just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many more companies that, uh, that do this. So these trackers, they, they don't have to be there. They don't have to be on the websites. Um, there's nothing, I think, about the um, sort of infrastructure of the internet which, which means that they have to be there. Um, they're there because of competition uh, to help um, our schools um, understand you know, who's using their websites and how to make them better uh, for marketing purposes. Um, and I, I would argue that, that to, to be involved in the collection and sharing on to an unknown number of third parties, um, students' data is, a, is possibly an unethical and, um, and dangerous practice. And there are other unethical and, and dangerous business practices that have been ditched in the past, and I think this one should be ditched too, uh, or at least um, we need to be more, more transparent and open about it to the extent that that's even possible. But as long as these trackers are there on websites, the data could be collected and end up with uh, yet another party, uh, a data broker like Axiom, which is the, the biggest or certainly one of the biggest in the world. Axiom, uh, it buys data off from um, you know, various organizations, you know, perhaps New Relic, I don't know. It's, it's just it's very hard to find out these things. Uh, they use that data, they combine it with um, publicly available data sets, for example, like uh, in the states, um, uh, enrollment, uh, sorry, um, electoral rolls, to create data packages. These are pro detailed profiles of people. They're made up of thousands of data points, which uh, Axiom then sells on, perhaps, for example, to, to insurance companies to help them determine insurance premiums. And you can see on the slide here some of the different um, of packages, there's um, you, you can buy off Axiom information about uh, uh, people's economic stability, their net worth, um, and you know whether uh, somebody and other household members have medical insurance, etc. Et uh, so this is partly what's meant by big data, or as some people um, put it, the new oil, and. Um, just looking at uh, this, just to have a brief look at this um, uh, report from these two think tanks. They've, they've been referred to as neoliberal think tanks, so they, they have a particular uh, right-wing um, uh, kind of free market ideology. Uh, but they released this report uh, last year. And they, they get funded, for example, by Google and IBM and Oracle uh, and HP, among others. Uh, they said in their report that global trade has come to rely on a vital new commodity, data. And data, it's not just a new natural resource, it's a key commodity in today's knowledge-based economy. And um, 
and it's seen as potentially adding um, a lot to uh, the growth and the value of, uh, of economies around the world. So whose data are we talking about? Well, we're talking about potentially our students' data uh, being uh, bought and sold uh, and contributing um, to this trade. And um, this, I think the least that we can say about this is that this is uh, dangerous and it, pre 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 uh, it presents, I think, a, a moral hazard um, if we are kind of implicating our students in this, especially without um, them or us being informed or, or giving consent. So, coming to the end, uh, response. Fortunately, I, I think there is a very simple response to companies who, who kind of indulge in these kinds of practices and, and operate in a way which make informed consent irrelevant. Um, basically, we make them irrelevant. Um, we uh, have nothing to do with them. Uh, sort of I've been thinking and, and um, done a lot of reading and talking over the last kind of two years and I'm increasingly kind of coming to the, to the belief that uh, there's no safe way to kind of operate um, with Facebook in the classroom without implicating our students and our staff in, in these kinds of um, dangers, putting them at risk um, or putting them, you know, um, uh, involving them in these moral hazard, hazards. Um, I think we, we just have to uh, ditch them. So I, I would recommend in terms of Facebook and um, other technologies that I've talked about uh, ban from use at your college. To do otherwise, I, I, I think, may be negligent. The dangers are increasingly well documented and it's becoming harder and harder for professionals to turn a blind eye. And companies like Facebook, are, are, they're not doing anything to, um, to, to sort of, um, on their end, to, to deal with these. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe the opposite, at least in some places. I would say, at the very least, have a DBYOD policy at your school. Don't bring your own device um, because if students are using their own devices, then the range of data that could be collected um, increases. Um, for example, if they download a, uh, the Facebook app, that app, depending on certain settings on their phone, uh, which they may not be aware of, can um, capture other data, for example, um, you know, names, addresses of, of friends and family. If internet access is required as part of a syllabus, then schools should provide devices and um, teachers should be using those devices uh, as much as possible. Uh, and again, have a don't bring your own device policy. And um, finally, in terms of response, um, we need to get real about digital literacy. Because to me, the, these are the they should be at the forefront. You know, whether somebody can um, can make a meme using Meme Generator or can you know do a mind map, you know, I, I, I really I think those are secondary um, to um, to these issues. So I'll just finish with um, this idea of the, the data blueprint. Um, I've kind of adapted this idea I came across during the um, the diploma of language teaching management. Um, the idea of the customer service blueprint, uh, which is, um, it kind of gets people in an organization to consider the customer's journey through your organization. So um, at the very first point of engagement, for example, with uh, the school's website, what sort of customer service experience does the student have? I want to sort of apply that to data. And uh, I'll just run through a few questions. And if you like, you can um, can type some responses, um, but uh, I think these are, uh, are useful questions to keep in mind. So consider what digital technologies do your students use as they interact with your organization? So you can type them um, into the chat box if you like, or just think. So think about uh, pre-enrollment, you know, are they accessing the Facebook page, are they accessing the website or Twitter, uh, Twitter feed? Um, um, when they um, you know, arrive, are they, um, are they doing like an online, an online placement test in class um, after uh, graduation? Um, so what sort of technologies at those different stages? 
and what data are those technologies gathering? Uh, uh, what are they? What data are they generating as students use them and, and move through your organisation and use different technologies? Third question, I'm trying to get up, is um, what control do your students have over the data? Uh, can they access it? Can they find out what um, data has been gathered? And if so, can they uh, have it removed, deleted uh, from um, whichever company um, kind of has it? Uh, this is think, uh, a strong principle of um, um, privacy legislation and privacy policies as well, possibly. Where and how is it stored? Uh, is it stored in a form which can be easily read by um, maybe somebody at that company, you know, somebody at Facebook or somebody who hacks into it? Uh, if it is accessed, is it stored in plain text or is it encrypted? Uh, how is it sent there? So from the student's device to uh, the Facebook server or Akamai or wherever it is, um, how is it transmitted? Is it encrypted end from the student's device to the server where it's stored? Uh, or is it transmitted in plain text form? Um, and then that, the implication would be that if it is intercepted, if it's kind of hacked uh, and received, it, it could be read and, and the student's privacy is breached. And finally, I think a really important question is, can your students opt out? Um, if they want to conscientiously object to sort of some of the, the, the practices that I've talked about, um, can they do that? Um, is that presented to them as a meaningful option? Uh, is it taken seriously uh, by the uh, by the organisation? So that's uh, that's the end of my um, my webinar this afternoon. Um, but I'd be interested. Um, in any responses that you have to those questions, any comments on the, the whole webinar or, or any questions about the whole webinar. So Kyle, we have a lot of comments coming through, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, I might just start with the last question you put up there, can your students opt out? Because this is what generated a few comments. The first, yep. the first comment we had was um, on if given an option to opt out of Turnitin, students will use it. But given the fact that schools are trying to standardize, or larger centers in particular, are trying to standardize and use it as an option to detect plagiarism, what would, what would the alternative be? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's, um, it's, it's tricky. Um, I think though that the more that I've read about um, Turnitin and, and also other um, similar tools is that they, um, that they may not actually be as effective as they seem to be. Um, for example, one study, I've got a post on this, uh, or I think a, yeah, a post which talks about this um, on my on my blog, um, one study talks about uh, one study kind of compared um, turned it in with um, I can't remember the name of the, the other one and Google and it found actually that that Google was I think in some cases more reliable at identifying um, matches with um, existing material so to, you know detecting plagiarism. So the question is, you know, what I think the question that, that I would want to ask um, is what evidence is there um, which demonstrates the benefits of Turnitin or, or any other technology for that matter? Um, you know, if we're making a, a kind of a cost-benefit analysis, weighing off the weighing up the benefits um, against the dangers, what evidence are we using to uh, to decide on the benefits? And I, I think that the, there is little evidence and there's certainly counter evidence uh, as to the um, effectiveness of Turnitin. Thanks Kyle. Um, just moving on to the next question which is about don't bring your own devices. Um, one of the questions is, is there a website that gives more information on the risks of bring your own devices as most organizations are now opting for this? Um, I think this is this is one of the challenges um, 
finding one place to go to to kind of get your head around this. I mean, it's so it's so kind of I found it very complex, and and um, it's taken me a, you know a, a lot of kind of reading to to try to get the hang of it. And you find I've, I found in one research article one sort of just one presentation of say what a cookie is, and then in another one quite a kind of a different presentation. So it's actually I find it quite confusing. Um, so the answer is um, kind of no. <laughs> There's no one place, but um, one place um, that I have found useful is called Me and My Shadow. I think it's just I'll just quickly get the the link. But I think if you type Me and My Shadow privacy, um, then that's a kind of a good plain speak uh, type of um, kind of. Um, website to, to help to get a, a hang of this. So that's me and my shadow, all one word? Uh, I, I'm not sure of the exact um, uh, link. I'll just try and quickly follow it, find it if I can. Nearly there. Uh, sorry, it's myshadow.org. My shadow, all one word. Okay, I'll just type that for um, for our attendees. Myshadow.org. Thank you, Kyle. Um, the next question, again, to do with don't bring your own devices, is the response to this would be for the school to have the infrastructure and invest in supplying these devices for, for students. And often schools do not have these resources, um, and that's just a thought. Um, yeah, um, I, I think it's um, yeah. I mean that, that's a that's a fair enough question. Um, again, it's it's a sort of uh, I guess it's for each individual school to, to weigh up again the um, you know, kind of I guess the risks, uh, the ethical concerns, and the um, the practicalities, and the, the sort of the you know the financial financials of it um, but I think again if, we, if we're trying to sincerely make a, uh, a judgment about the, the dangers the risks um, versus the, the benefits then um, you know perhaps there's some things that we're not considering some of the things that I've raised this afternoon sure um, we've had a comment uh, saying our school actually encourages bring your own devices and I think one of the points with this is um, the fact that in some ways there's a lot of pressure on teachers and schools to engage with our students who are digital natives um, and we, we seldom hear arguments about teachers don't use technology it's more about if you want to be employed with us please use more technology in the classroom it's a way to engage your learners um, do you have any thoughts on from a teacher's perspective how would you counter these kind of pressures um. I guess um, so. Pressure on teachers, sort of in the era of digital natives. Um, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost. Um, I've lost focus on the question. So can you just? I, I um, can repeat. Uh, I can okay. sum up the question for you. Um, there's a lot of pressure on teachers to use some kind of technology in the classroom. Teachers who are not te te technologically savvy are often um, hard pressed to find employment. How would yep. you state your stance in an organisation like that? Um, okay, yeah, that's that's a very it's a very hard question, um, and I guess I'm fortunate that uh, that currently, at least, I'm I'm employed. <laughs> um, I don't I don't have to worry for the time being about that, um, um, and also I, I guess I would consider myself fairly tech savvy. Um, so that that's that's a hard question. It, it goes sort of to um, you know maybe kind of more broader kind of sociological issues about um, about the, the the maybe overemphasis on on technology in our society more broadly. So you know I wouldn't kid myself that um, you know having a don't B Y O D you know, don't bring your own device policy you know, does anything about that or um, and, and it perhaps, you know, in a way, just increases the uh, the pressure on teachers. Yep. Um, 
I guess what I'm hoping to do again is coming back to the idea of changing our default settings is I think our default settings is kind of um, leaves students open and staff open to um, to some moral hazards and some dangers in terms of who's got their data and, and what's done with it. Um, and we need to start to consider that and, and maybe maybe slowly. Um, I mean, I'd like to see you know, instant change, obviously, but um, more realistically, maybe slowly across the industry, start to talk about it more, start to raise it more, start to ask for evidence. Well, where's the evidence that, that uh, Turnitin uh, actually provides value for money, for one thing, and, and actually does the job um, and therefore is worth kind of trading off um, students' intellectual property and data um, uh, for? We, you know, where, where is the evidence? Same thing with uh, the idea of digital natives. You know, where, where is the evidence um, to support that concept, um, to support the idea of kind of 21st century learning? You know, where is the evidence? And also, who, where are these concepts, these terms, uh, this agenda coming from? Who, who's sort of driving it? You know, it's probably not coming in the first place from management at your school. Uh, it, to some extent, you know, it comes from politicians beyond them. It comes from think tanks. It comes from um, you know, it comes from academia, uh, it comes from all different sorts of places. Um, so, I mean, that in itself can be overwhelming. Um, but I guess I'd come back to the idea of, you know, maybe changing our default settings. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe if we bring it back to the idea of digital, digital literacy, maybe that's um, something we can start to, maybe that's a way in in our schools. You know, we can start to... Um, Re-emphasize, you know, maybe emphasize some of these issues more if we are interested in talking about digital literacy in, in the classroom. Kyle, I think that's a great way to sum up today's session because I think a lot of the questions, and I'm sorry if we haven't got to all of them, uh, because a lot of, there was a lot of repetition in terms of the kind of questions we're getting and comments we're getting. Um, you're right in terms of the pressures that come through and to question where these are coming from. For example. Um, the academic department would face a lot of pressure from marketing department in terms of pushing certain things towards students. Um, the websites, for example, the way they're designed to collect information about our students. Um, at the moment, maybe we can't affect immediate change, but as you said, Kyle, starting to think about these issues in terms of the long-term impact and long-term solutions would be, would be a starting point. If I could just say one more thing um, as well, is you could uh, maybe do what I've done, which is uh, I wrote to the um, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner just to sort of try to ask how the privacy principles relate to these kinds of issues that, are, that we've talked about this afternoon. And they said they're very busy and they'll, it'll take them a couple of weeks to get back. But um, you could do something similar if you, if you kind of got a, a question, um, then uh, you could call them, which I did. Um, and, uh, and also write to them and, and perhaps that could help you in your colleges if you're you know, maybe trying to get the default settings changed. Mm, good point. Um, there was a comment, uh, and may, we're out of time now, but there was a comment about the assumption that everyone using these technologies, are they're, they're all adults, but assuming that our students are fully aware, even though they're adults, um, maybe something maybe an unrealistic expectation when in fact we are not as, a, as aware ourselves uh, of the implications of some of the technology we use. Yeah, sort of it's kind of like the biggest myth, biggest lie on the internet people might say. Exactly. Kyle, thank you so much for that very informa informative session today. Um, it was really great and it's very thought provoking as some of our comments um, indicate. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon um, and thank you Kyle. Thank you very much, pleasure. So that's the end of our webinar. I will be putting up the recording on the English Australia website so please have a look. Uh, please also pass it on to your colleagues who might have missed out today. Thanks once again to Kyle and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks, bye-bye.